Well, uh, we're back um, back at it, and uh, good morning, Betsy and and Helen. Um, we Senator Polina will be with us in a matter of moments, and um, I we wanted to talk about um, you know the food situation and and local grown and and all those good things. Um, see how the you know your it went this past year and what we would should be doing uh, to move to you know this year and get get going on it before we before the boat sails uh, so welcome and i don't know do you want to lead off betsy or how um, sure, I can say a few words and then Rosie Kruger is on so she can um, better give an update on the applications to the local purchasing incentive, um, which the deadline just passed this weekend. So we're really excited. I would say that the Agency of Education received 30 applications, which means over half the SUs applied already at just in this first opening round. So we were really pleased about that level of interest. Um, we're also uh, super excited that the governor in his budget has funded the AOE position for administering the program and the local purchasing incentive at the amount we feel is correct which is 500,000. It's still one-time funding. And I think for schools to be able to change their systems and change their purchasing, they're gonna to wanna to count on um, more funding than one-time funding, not knowing whether that's gonna continue or not. Um, and I think that that level of interest just adds to our request that we fully fund the Farm to School and Early Childhood Grants Program. So to be able to provide the kind of support to schools, especially the ones that haven't applied yet, you know, making sure that they can set up systems, they know which products will be eligible, where to connect and buy them, follow the rules for procurement, you know, all that stuff. In yeah. all the states like Oregon and Michigan and New York, the schools successful have a lot of technical assistance and support in those early years until things get going. Um, and at this point, we looked at the grants program, the Farm to School and Early Childhood Grants. And in FY21, only about 24% of the funds that were requested uh, were able to be awarded. So, you know, there's a lot of demand out there uh, that we're not meeting. Um, and I guess I might stop there if there's particular questions and maybe Rosie can give a more detailed update. Yeah, uh, good morning, Rosie, good to see you. Um, good morning. So uh, 30, you've had 30 applications and and so I, I do actually want to correct that a little bit. Um, we'd initially uh, told the advocates 30 before we removed duplicates. So we actually received 23 applications. Yeah. And what? And I should just say for the record, Rosie Kruger, State Director of Child Nutrition Programs, Agency of Education. What was yeah. that, Senator? How many, uh, how many issues do we have that could apply? Uh, it's uh, about 50. Two, I think. I don't. I, I work with a bunch of independent schools as well, so I think in terms wow. of the total number of, of school food authorities, um, but I think it's around um, fifty or fifty-two uh, SUs who could have applied. Yeah. So, uh, so that, so would you say that that we've had close to fifty percent so far? Yeah, I will say. Looking at the list, um, the SUs who applied are generally the the better provisioned SUs who have the staff dedicated um, who had time to do this. Um, we're not seeing some of the highest poverty schools um, who have really been struggling recently. And that's a downside of any grant program um, as we talked about last week. Um, 
in general, though, um, if we, with those applications that we received, um, we've actually exceeded the allocation. Um, so if we fully funded the 23 we received uh, at 15 cents per meal served last year, um, we would require uh, $542,947. Um, so instead, we're going to have to pre prorate as, as uh, listed in the, the legislation, um, we're going to have to prorate those award amounts to about 13 point, uh, 13 point 18 cents per lunch uh, served last year instead of 15. So, so we need to work on, we need to work on the funding a little bit, as well as helping some school districts, maybe a little more to get them on board to, to take advantage of this. Yeah, I mean, I think with any grant program, it's it's up to the the way it's set up is it's up to the SFA about whether the value of the funding is um, is worth their ability to to put towards it and applying. Um, and if they don't have the people there to sit down and write the application, then they're not going to apply. Um, I will also say that the first year of the grant is very simple. We, you know, you all intentionally structured it that way. Um, and then the subsequent years are much more complicated and require a lot of extensive tracking and require um, a lot of follow-up um, and auditing on the agency's part. Um, so I would expect, I was surprised, frankly, that so few applied for the first year, given that it is a fairly simple application for the first year, but also not surprised given the constraints on the schools at this moment. Um, next year, I would expect to see probably those remaining folks, um, assuming things have um, eased up a little bit for them. Those remaining folks who didn't apply for the first year, I would expect to see them apply. Um, I would expect to see some folks who applied for the initial year drop off next year um, because they determine either that they're not eligible based on their purchases for the current school year, um, or they determine that it's too much work and it's not feasible. Yeah, yeah, uh, Chris. Thank you, uh, Rosie. So. Just back to the amount of money for the people that are going to get uh, the award. Am I right that we had a half a million in there? So that we're 40,000 shy of being able to give them the 15 cents. Is that the math or could you help yep. us? Uh, just under 43,000 shy. Because I, I think if we want to, you know, from where I sit, I'd like this to be robust and permanent, but that's not the way the legislature works. Uh, and so we, we sort of inch forward as much as possible, but we're starting, you know, clearly there's dem demand there. Uh, but as you say, this is the easy year and people will be making this calculation in an ongoing way. And I would guess the cost benefit analysis versus do we actually pay them the 15 cents is a pretty big factor for moving forward. So uh, if we were able to get 43,000 added to budget adjustment, would that, would, would that, what's the timeline to help you guys say, okay, good, we can do the 15 cents. Um, I'll start with we that. We have a statutory deadline in terms of when we need to pay out the grant and it's pretty quick. I don't actually have it at my fingertips. I don't know if, um, if uh, Betsy or Helen have it in front of them. Um, I wanna say that it's uh, March. Um, so it's gonna take us a couple weeks to get grant agreements together. So we need to know in the next, week or two that this was happening because we wouldn't want to send grant agreements out for the lower amount and then have to revise them later. Well, okay. we, we actually have the rest of this week and part of next week before we vote the supplemental, but it will be right away. So uh, I would say by the end of January, uh, we should know if we can get the extra 40 odd thousand or not. So that, that would put us in a pretty good window uh, for you to be able to operate if you knew by the, the end of, of January. Yeah, I see that, that Helen put in March 31st as our deadline to make the payments. So if we know by the end of January, 
uh, that would give us appropriate time to get grant agreements out and, and make those payments. Yeah. And I okay. do want to highlight again for you, though, that, um, you know, in terms of your value of where is this money best spent, um, this is not necessarily going to the highest need schools. This is going to the schools that already have the capacity to do this. Um, so just- Well, you, you know, we, you. we welcome enough money to to facilitate other schools, all the schools doing it, right? The, the goal here is is long been, for, from my point of view, to make this as standard as possible across the state. But this is, uh, the Senate Ag Committee, and in terms of helping the farming community, um, I think there's compete not competing interest, but broadly, uh, we need local food in schools, and and you know, I think if you're just looking from an agricultural economic impact, maybe the the which schools are applying is secondary. That's not necessarily where my values are, but our goal is to bake this into the ag economy, I think. Um, can you add, talk to me about um, this sort of dependability question? This is a theme for me that I think we need to try and work on. And the law and the the ramping up and the, the, the out years, that is the law. Then the question is of funding sources. And, and are you hearing, Rosie, or, or for any of our witnesses, is it, I mean, the law is the law, so that's dependable. The funding less def dependable at this moment. Is that part of the calculation for people? I, I mean, from where I sit, we've kind of committed to the funding. We just haven't, we haven't put the line item in, but the policy commits to the funding to some degree. So I wonder if you could just comment on that, Rosie, and then, and then our other witnesses. Yeah, um, that was certainly um, a little bit of a conversation um, at the agency, um, and I don't fully understand this, um, but it seems like some of the language um, maybe wasn't quite right. But I, I understood that your intention was for this to be a permanent position at the agency to manage the grant program and a permanent um, uh, a permanent grant program, and then the funding levels might vary. Um, but uh, there was something about the way that the position was written um, that made it a little unclear that that was meant to be permanent. And I don't, I don't have language to suggest to you because I'm not really sure what that was. But I know that that was a little bit of a question, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what Betsy was was alluding to as well. Um, in terms of the school's willingness to apply, uh, based on understanding that this is a permanent program. Um, it is a little bit of a risk that they're taking because the way that it is structured, the grant payout and whether they're eligible next year is based on what they do this year. So uh, they have to make a decision this year, okay, we're going to take that risk and purchase more local foods, even though they're more expensive in the hopes that this will make us eligible for a payout next year. Um, if suddenly, you know, there's big budget cuts and, you know, only 250,000 is available next year, um, and they've made that calculation based on assuming that they're going to get the full amount of 15 cents per lunch, um, that would be a hit to them um, and might cause them to be, you know, they may be thinking about that when they decide whether to apply or not. Um, I don't know what ability you have to, to budget for multiple years at a time um, or to, to appropriate for multiple years at a time. Um, but I think it's always a, a question with grant programs and this one in particular, because it, it's a kind of a look back um, that, that makes it more complicated. Yeah, we, we really don't usually appropriate for two years unless it's a you know, year program. Uh, which we want to make this, if we can, a permanent thing. Uh, so it would be a yearly, uh, you know, budgeted on a yearly basis. Uh, but it's always, it's always helpful if the agency involved, whether it's you folks at Ed or Ag, if they come in with it in their budget, um, you know, we usually go for it, uh, unless there's some very severe problems. And as we all know, um, you know, there's money available 
now and there should be still plenty available down the road because our our ed fund our general tax receipts are all all running very very strong uh, none of us know what will happen once all the federal money gets used up and gone but we're everything we're working on is longevity so it should keep people working uh, keep taxes coming in and but you know who's got the crystal ball none of us so um but to get you know to pick up that extra forty three thousand um you know is it shouldn't we should be able to get that for you so um i don't know what the other members think but uh we got finance represented here and in government ops and and uh so there should be there should be forty three thousand available somewhere. Uh, Chris. Well, I, I would just say, you know, we're giving grants of forty three thousand to single businesses. This is yeah. this is really trying to to help a, a segment of our ag economy, and, and so shame on us if we can't come up with that money. I I, I think I hope we will plan for success and and. Um, see if we you know uh try everything we can to really lock this in for the years ahead and and uh it's just such a no-brainer i can't the logistics is hard rosie you've schooled me and all of us in how complex it is and and how much the feds tie your hands and all of that and there's good people working on this but um it's just far too sensible and and when i think about the the grant the money we're granting to businesses across the board uh, you know th this is almost an embarrassingly small sum frankly <laughs> um but anyways we'll keep moving forward with that um the uh, so uh your employee uh, uh rosie is it's on a temporary basis and not a permanent. Um, no, no, the, the position is a permanent position um, and was created that way. Um, I think that was your intention and it's written as a permanent position, but there was something about how that was funded um, that was just, the language wasn't quite right uh, to say that this is um, intended to be funded permanently. And I don't really, like, this is not my side of things. Um, so I don't fully understand what the language is um but the agency could probably work with ledge council to figure out what that issue was um and and get you some uh updated language there well i wonder if that'll float through education and then back to appropriations or or but it, we need a, a probably we should have a something on that a letter or something to get that straightened out or i as uh brian has brian mentioned anything to any of you folks about that brian um campton campion have you talked with him in regards to that rosie in education or no, um, this is a fairly recent thing that's come up. So I, um, you know, we hired the position. It's it's uh, hired as a permanent position, but I think there was some question about funding. Um, it is in the governor's request for this year um, to be funded for this year, but I think the agency was maybe thinking we needed a little bit of a change to make sure that that was an ongoing um, funding thing. So I, that, I don't know what that, that change is. I'm sorry. <laughs> that will probably then come up when we have um, uh, the secretary in in front of i hope in front of appropriations that that needs uh that language needs to be adjusted so do you have access to your 
financial people, Rosie? I can um, let them know that you are asking about this and uh, ask them what the language would, would need to be. Um, and we can- Yeah, because- it, uh, It's available. When, you know, usually we all have the secretary come before appropriations. Uh, he'll say, well, we need this tweet or that tweet to make it all work. And, and then we just do it. Um, but it'd be good if you could mention that to your superiors and then they'll maybe look at it and tend to it. I can do that. Um, okay. Um, other questions uh, for Rosie or Rosie, do you have other? I, I actually have to jump off. I have another meeting. Um, Wednesdays are a pretty busy day in child nutrition land, um, but uh, I, can I can stay for just a minute more, but I, I need to head off in a second. Yeah, anything else for Rosie from any of the members? If not, thanks Rosie for being with us and all you do over there, we appreciate it. Great, take care. Um, so uh, Betsy, did we want to move to Helen to have, would you want to tell us Helen how things went with with uh, NOFA and how that's all working mm -hmm. out, this program's all working out for you folks. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Senator. Um, good morning, everyone. For the record, um, Helen Rorfett, the Farmer School Program Director at NOFA Vermont, which is a Farmer School partnership with Shelburne Farms. Um, and we at, um, at NOFA have had the privilege this fall of working with um, schools and SFAs to apply for this inaugural round of funding. Um, we did outreach to all 50 some odd of the, um, of the supervisor unions and school districts that would be eligible to apply um, and got a pretty great response overall. We're really pleased to see that you know, 23 um, actually ended up submitting an application. Uh, we had a number of really great conversations with folks who are very excited about this program, but intentionally decided not to apply this year for a couple of reasons. You know, running the gamut from, we just don't have the bandwidth this year because of everything else going on being a, a really sort of significant reason, which is perfectly understandable. And given the really tight timeline of this year's program, um, I think it was just hard for people to add one more thing at that time, at that busy time of year, during a very busy year. Um, there was also a number of schools who have been sort of thinking about the, um, the longer term um, plan and their strategy with interacting with this program and recognizing that there is in your first year that easier threshold to clear. Some schools have sort of started doing the math and looking down, um, looking down the, um, the pike a little bit and realizing that, you know what, we could apply for the grant this year and we could get the pilot year funding because it is relatively easy, but we're concerned because it's over halfway through this current school year that we won't get to 15 next year. And so then we would have a gap in our eligibility. So they're thinking, you know what, let's take this year, get our systems in place, get our ducks in a row, and we'll put in our pilot year application next year, assuming the program is funded. And then they'll be in a better and stronger position to achieve 15% the year after that. So I think that that's a calculation that a number of um, SFAs are, um, are thinking through. And that's, a, um, I think, a phenomenon we can expect to see. I also do want to, um, to lift up and point out um, what Rosie mentioned, that there will likely be some schools who did apply this year and maybe they don't quite hit 15% for next year. So we may see a small drop in the number of schools that are eligible moving forward, but the, the likelihood, you know, they're not dropping to 0%. They might come in at 13, 14%, something close, and, but they're showing that they're, they're gonna have progress towards that goal. And I've talked with a number of schools that might be in a position like that, and they're comfortable. They understand that it might mean one year of not being eligible for the grant, but then it's just a real small hurdle for them to clear to get. Um, to become eligible for a subsequent year. So I think that there's, um, there's a lot of enthusiasm for this program. People really appreciate it. It is exciting. Um, it's something that has rallied school nutrition programs um, in, in an otherwise kind of really stressful um, time. And I do really appreciate all of the agency's efforts to streamline the application process and make it truly as simple as possible. It really, it, we, we have a 
template of the application that we've posted on the Vermont Feed website to, to show schools and to show business offices exactly how easy it is. So really want to appreciate that. Um, so any any questions that are coming up? Well, I'm um, glad to hear you had how many turnout when you were doing your your uh, fall uh, meetings? So we we individually called and emailed all 50 some odd school districts and supervisory unions. And, you know, not everyone had bandwidth to, to connect with us, but quite a lot. I'd have to check. We have a, a, a spreadsheet of notes for everyone that we've reached out to. But it was it was well over half of them that we um, had specific conversations with. So I'm looking forward to seeing the report from from Agency of Education when they have time to compile it to see who the actual applicants were and square that with our notes of who we had conversations with um, to see who ultimately applied and who's maybe thinking about um, applying next year uh, and they held off. So. Yeah, uh, questions from committee members, any questions? Uh, um, uh, Chris? Yeah, just, just uh, I guess, Helen, I'd love to hear your response to the similar question of Rosie that I put to Rosie in terms of this being um, the policy in law, the money being, you know, less straightforward. Um, what, I, I just help me understand the calculation. Like, are people looking at this and sort of thinking, I'm not sure the state means it, uh, or, or, or just what's, what's the attitude that you're picking up out there? And, and I, 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 as everyone said, yeah. You couldn't have a more intense year in a school cafeteria. I, I mean, good Lord. So right. rec I want to really recognize that. And, and my comment is not at all to, to suggest people are not trying hard their hardest. My hat's off to yeah. the folks. But I, but I want to understand from our point of view, from this the state policy and funding point of view, what do we need to do to, to communicate our seriousness here? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that question. I uh, my sense is that people are confident that you guys mean what you say and that you are going to find a way to fund this program moving forward. Um, we do have those conversations with folks. We do let them know that it is contingent upon funding um, year in and, and year out, at least at this point. Um, but I think that isn't what's holding people back more than just the capacity, more than anything. I think you've hit the nail on the head. It is just a really, really difficult year. I think also the fact that this program, um, you know, we're building the plane and flying it too. This year, um, the Agency of Education uh, hired their new their new position, and they got the program up and running <clears throat> in record time. But it still wasn't, you know, the the um, the memo wasn't released to schools until later in the fall, and the deadline in in January. So it was a pretty tight scramble for people to make that decision about if they're going to apply this year or wait till next year. But Moving forward, we won't have that issue. People now are aware of this program. We've been doing a lot of outreach, having great conversations. A lot of schools are already thinking about this time next year, having their, um, their applications in. Um, so I think they are confident the program is going to be around and they are starting to map out their own strategy that's gonna work best for their school districts. Um, and I really wanted to, if it's okay, circle back to um, the issue that Rosie raised around um, equity and, and ensuring that this program works for all of the schools. Um, that is a, a goal that, that we have certainly as technical assistance providers um, to be able to do that outreach and work with the schools that haven't traditionally been served by the farm to school grants program or other um, you know, grants that are coming from the AOE. Um, and it's going, it just takes, it takes time to be able to work with those schools and bring them online and, and help them um, develop their systems. But I really think this opportunity has the potential to be that game changer to really bring schools into the fold and, and, um, and get their local purchasing started in a, in a really meaningful way. I think the offer of actual funding is, 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 a, is a great way to open the door for schools to get involved with this. Well, besides offering real good fresh produce, um, what about how's it how's it translating with the number of farms or or produce growers that we have? Are they 
are they taking part well in in this program? Yeah, so that's something that we're trying to identify uh, how to how to track and how to understand the impact of, of this program on our um, agricultural economy. And it's a work in progress. And it, you know, it's interesting because this grant sends funds to the schools who then make the purchasing decisions and, and have purchasing relationships. So we are trying to do more um, in terms of tracking local. I think that's been a challenge for schools for, for many, many years, tracking who they're buying from and what products and what the demand is. Um, but this program incentivizes that practice in a really meaningful way. So once we're a couple of years into the program, we'll have some really meaningful data because schools will be required to track what products they're purchasing and from whom. And we'll really be able to dig into that question much more meaningfully moving forward. And then we can, uh, you know, st uh, strategically target certain product areas um, and just to, to make sure that this program is truly working for the benefit of our producers. But our first step that we really need uh, to create some time and capacity for is to, is to develop a, a pre-verified product list. I think navigating the, the definition of local that's required by this program is one of the challenges for schools. And as we move forward into these years where they're gonna be required to track, um, there's gonna be a lot of need for, for support in getting those systems, um, those tracking systems running. Um, but those, once they are, we'll have a lot more data to really understand the, the impact. Yeah, I, uh, Rosie, uh, Betsy. Yeah, and maybe Helen, thank you, Senator and um, I apologize for not introducing myself for the record, Betsy Rosenbluth, Project Director of Vermont Feed at Shelburne Farms. Um, maybe Helen can elaborate, but my conversations um, with school nutrition directors, there's a lot of interest in proteins because that center of the plate um, and thinking about how to buy local beef in particular, we know a number of school nutrition programs are switching to local beef and how that can be more widespread is significant. So in addition to fruits and vegetables, I think that component as well as dairy, not fluid milk, but other dairy, you know, is there an opportunity to make that easy and clear and eligible product because there's, you know, significant quantities being purchased. So those are some of the categories um, that we're looking at with the school nutrition directors. Yeah. I'm red meat <laughs> we we tried to push that issue along and we're we're in serious discussions today even not not on the committee but with the federal meat people and our state meat people but we've certainly uh, have put a lot of money into our local um, facilities to process uh, red meat and, and you know, sheep and, and the whole nine yards. And hopefully, yes, we can, hopefully we can get, boost that beef market and our local uh, meat products uh, so schools would be able to buy that because we ran into all kinds of shortages uh, what last year, and you go to the stores today, and there's still um, very uh, few selections that you can make at a, an affordable price for red meat. So, so we need to do. We need to do more work on that, Betsy, on the language or. Um, well, I'll leave that question to Helen. Um, because if we need to strengthen the language to encourage that or, or to make it so that it would be legal to purchase uh, protein, high protein products, uh, you know, we'd be, I'm sure the committee would be willing to look at that. Yeah, right now there it's eligible. Um, I think it is a question of um, sourcing in a cost-effective way, and that varies across the state depending on where you are. 
Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, we will probably come back to you after a little more experience with um, whether we need to tweak the definition of local. We'll probably work with the Agency of Agriculture just to make sure that the state official definition of local works for the school purchasing world. Um, so we're not prepared this session to make those tweaks. I think we want to learn a little bit more um, and maybe next year come back with some suggested ways to make this a little smoother process as we learn. Yeah, I know um, uh, the food hub uh, or the place in Hardwick was going to set up, um, I thought, a distribution uh, system so they would have like a, a steady route uh, of delivering out of northern Vermont, anyhow. I don't know if that ever got up in, in uh, running or if you know if it got up and is running or not. But yeah, there's a, there's a, um, a wide network um, an expanding, ever expanding network of regional food hubs um, in, in Vermont that have been serving institutions, um, including the Center for an Ag Economy in Hardwick, I think which you're referring to, um, and then also um, Green Mountain Farm Direct, which is based in, the, in Newport in the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, they serve a lot of schools uh, in, in, in nor in all across Northern Vermont with their delivery routes. And then there's Food Connects down in the Brattleboro region, which serves much of um, Southeastern Vermont, uh, and of course into neighboring New Hampshire and and Massachusetts as well. Um, but there's really, this is what's something that's very hopeful about this program is throughout the state, um, we're seeing more and more of these regional food hubs, aggregators coming online. There's, it's, there's work happening in Rutland and Addison County as well, which would make it easier for schools to access more local products. So I think that is another really wonderful benefit of the timing of this program, because it really supports the expansion of, of these really important local regional distributors. So. Yeah. Uh, Brian, uh, how's that? hub working in your area down there in Rutland that we went and visited a few years back. It's going very well, Bobby. Um, yeah. yeah, and the farmer's market, of course, continues to operate indoors in the summer or in the winter and outside in the summer. But yeah, it's, uh, it's going very well. And do they have any type of distribution uh, system or do you have to drive there to purchase your products? I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Is that it really works best for hot lunch uh, programs, school programs, if if the products delivered, you know, to the to the program, you know, on a weekly or yeah. or even even biweekly basis. Um, Maybe Brian, you could check that that out sometime uh, if you have a minute and sure. see if there's more that we might be able to help them with as far as setting up a, a little distribution system. Yeah, I could check with uh, Greg Cox. Yeah, uh, Chris. Yeah, thank you. I, I want to come back to the durability of this because it would be a real shame to have this be a flash in the pan. And so I'm, I'm curious, we heard such compelling testimony from the one of the people involved in New York. And I know that other states, Michigan, maybe Oregon, New Mexico have done this. Any, any sense from other places uh, of the durability and, and, you know, has it, has it been a fad or is it, is it, what, what, what are we learning or do you have knowledge about what's going on elsewhere? Yeah, I think with almost no exceptions that I'm aware of, the programs in other states that are similar to this have just been growing over time. As, as the word gets out to more and more school districts and as they figure out um, the systems to, to, to be eligible for the funding, that demand remains. Once you have a school in that, in that program, it is to their benefit to continue um, participating and keep up that level of, of local purchasing. And I know that you know Oregon, for example, they're probably the the, the nation's first um, program. They've had a 
program, I can't remember, Betsy, you may know, um, for a number of years, and they've been very successful in um, getting more and more funding as the program, the demand for the program has grown over the years. Um, and we, we've been able to talk with the folks who run that program and the Michigan program, and of course our, our colleagues over in New York quite a bit as we've been rolling out the program here, trying to understand best practices. But really the trend that, I'm, that we're seeing nationwide is once these programs start, they, there's a lot of demand for them and the demand grows over time. And so therefore the, the funding to fully support them uh, is, is growing over time as well. But that just creates more economic impact for, for all the farmers and producers that are selling to those programs. Yeah. Um, other questions, uh, Betsy, do you have any anything else that we should hear, uh, hear about? on how things are going. Uh... I think that's what we have to say today. Um, you know, I would second what Helen's saying in, in some of these states. I mean, they're talking about a scale, like all of the schools, the entire state of Vermont is the equivalent probably of, you know, Portland city school system or something. But they are putting, all these states are putting just millions of dollars into this because they see that, you know, win-win and direct return that your committee talks about so much, going right back to benefiting the farmers in the oh, state. That so, thing just went. My computer just froze up again. Okay. Oh, are you there, there Chris? You're, you're back, yep. <laughs> boy, oh boy. <laughs> Uh, it's really fun. It just so um, well. Bet I Betsy was just saying what a smart investment this is. <laughs> you mean internet and broadband? <laughs> that too. <laughs> we we need work, and hundreds of millions are putting into it. And I hope to heck it it works when we get done spending all that money. Um, well, yeah, we, we really want to support and we do as, as much as, as we know how uh, to support our, our feeding our children, feeding our people with locally produced food. And um, um, hopefully it'll, It'll mushroom and and uh, spread, and we'll uh, we'll change that twenty four percent to a positive, uh, really, you know, a good positive number. Um, so I think, and if there isn't any more questions, um, we know that that we need to talk about getting funding for. Uh, the person at the ed department. Uh, so, uh, and then we need to raise the the money to pay school districts so we can keep that at the 15 cent level. Uh, the only, what we've got to do is get someone, we as a committee have got to get uh, some of our staff to draft that up so we can hand it to the appropriations committee uh, or present it to them in a formal uh, way. Uh, anything else from questions by any of the members? Uh, if not, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Betsy and, and Helen, and uh, we'll uh, We'll let you go and get back with it. And uh, uh, Chris? Well, Mr. Chair, question for you and for others, the committee. Um, I wonder if we should talk to Senator Sorokin and the folks on economic development. I mean, it just, it's so frustrating that this isn't a no brainer in their, in their mindset. And, you know, my God, if anyone wanted to cut a few million out of VEPSI, in a year, the the earth would shake, and and the business community would come and tell you how how valuable that all those resources are, and 
And here we're talking about a tiny amount of money for a whole s- swath of our rural economy. And so I, I guess I'd just like us to think about strategies that bakes this in, in, a, in a more permanent, ongoing way so that we don't have to hope that we can pull it out every session. And, um, well, yeah, that doesn't make any sense that we right. spend time every year. Uh, uh, but, you know, when you're starting something brand new, and, and I think, you know, we've done, we've done fairly well uh, from an ag committee to economic development uh, that that crew uh, in the next room uh, we don't well, if we were in the building I think it'd be much easier to accomplish um, you know running next door and chatting with them but um, well if you don't mind I'll explore that and see if that's something that yeah. they'd consider or if they have any advice for us no, that's where all the money is, uh, really. So that that would be good, Chris. Um, and um, so with that, uh, thanks a lot, uh, both again to Betsy and Helen, and uh, uh, keep up the good work. Thanks so much for having us today. Yeah, yeah. thank you for your support. Well, we enjoy working with you as well. Um, well, committee, um, we have Ellen uh, Keeler with us uh, this morning, um, and we're going to stick with New England feeding New England and talking about food and all those good things. Uh, so uh, good morning, Ellen, and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Lovely to see you all. Happy New Year. Hope you're staying COVID free. Oh, nice and comfortable here. <laughs> and, Excellent. And pretty safe at home. Yeah. Um, so uh, Mr. Chair, what would you like me to focus on? I do have some slides that I, uh, that I sent to Linda that I'm happy to walk us through or if you have a different pleasure, I'm happy to entertain. Uh, well, no, we don't have any particular uh, process, uh, you know, in line. Uh, however, you feel comfortable uh, presenting uh, the slides to us. Uh, that I think uh, Linda made your co-host, so you can present the slides at your pleasure. Okay. And then we'll. Uh, get through that and then if there are questions, we'll move on to those. All right, that sounds terrific. Um, So for the record, Ellen Kaler, Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund and uh, the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund, as you well know, administers the Vermont Farm to Plate program. Thank you very much for continued support and all that. Um, And then um, as part of that work over the last at least 10 years, 10 years, um, I have been having conversations and meeting with our counterparts in the other five New England states. And as I think I mentioned to you last January, I talked with you about this exciting new project called New England Feeding New England, which is now well underway. So I thought I could give you an update on where we are at with the very uh, important research that's being done, because I know that all of you, as we are too, uh, within Far to Plate, very interested in the ways in which we could expand our local food production so that we can f- be able to have more security that during times of crisis and emergency that we can have a better chance of feeding ourselves, but also in non-emergency times that we can be providing more of what we produce to other New England states, that we could actually create much more of a regional food system. And the other five New England states are also considering similar things, but as is usual, we are the pace setters. We are uh, very much more out in front in terms of the level of coordination and collaboration and and 
and impact on the ground that we've been achieving over these last 10 years. Um, and so other states are, are watching us, they're mimicking us in many ways, and, uh, and, and, they're, and they're gearing up to also increase production, which is a good thing if we think about it from a regional food system perspective. So that's, that's what this uh, frame up is all about. And I'll, I'll share the slides here uh, with you. I don't have too many, so I'll, I'll move through these um, fairly quickly. So th this uh, is a project that Vermont Farm to Plate and my shop is very active in. We are actually serving as the fiscal sponsor for the funding that uh, we've raised from the USDA and some foundation partners to support this work. And uh, just as a reminder uh, that this project, our goal is to consider what would it take in terms of regional food production to get to a point where 30% of all the food consumed in New England was actually produced, harvested, or caught from within New England, right? So it's a 30 by 2030 kind of goal. And you um, may or may not have heard that we are very close to announcing what our local food counts are for just Vermont. And we are gonna land somewhere between 17 and 17.8% 17 of local food consumption. Uh, and that's up from about 5% in 2010 when we first started Farm to Plate. So we've made a huge improvement uh, it's north of $400 million a year in local food consumption that we're doing here in Vermont. But 17% is still a, a ways away to get to 30% by 2030. And we think other states are not, e are not close to where we are at 17%. So they have an even farther distance to travel. So this yeah. project- Is that 17% of the total food consumed? Yes. Boy, that, that's a big number then. It, it is. It, it has grown a lot. Uh, back in 2010, at 5%, that's about $110 million worth of local food sales. And we're projecting from having done the 2020 local food counts work that we're going to be north of 400,000. I'm sorry, 400 million uh, is, is what that 17% represents. Well, Ellen, is that is that dollar a percentage of dollars spent or calories intake dollar spent dollar spent sales yep okay thanks yep and that's both in the home food consumed in the home and outside of the home so restaurants and the reason i don't have a final number for you is is jake is doing one last final check with some restaurants uh, on, on, a, on a data point and so we are getting ready to uh, formally announce the the final 2020 totals so excited about that so the purpose of this project then is to work towards fortifying our regional food supply and distribution systems in an equitable and inclusive way that in ensures the ability of adequate affordable socially and culturally appropriate products <laughs> under a variety of rapidly changing climate environmental and public health conditions so as i said we're looking to to shore up our supply chains and our distribution system and our production infrastructure for both non-emergency times but then so that they're prepared for times of emergency or climate disruption or supply chain disruptions. And just so you know, this work, this regional work is in total alignment with what's in our new state Vermont Ag and Food System Strategic Plan that we released to you all back last February. We made sure that we were part of the whole, whole region and that the region also, the, 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 and we're making sure that the regional work is reflected in how, what we're doing here in Vermont, okay? So what we're doing right now is uh, working on some very relevant and timely foundational research and analysis to, that will be provided to each state and that can be then rolled up into the six state region. Uh, and then that research, we think, uh, so by this time next year, you will have some, some additional uh, materials to work with to be able to think about strategic 
additional strategic investments uh, in the public and uh, private nonprofit sector, and, and also to guide philanthropic uh, investments, but really looking at those investment decisions about where we need additional infrastructure, where we need a, additional systems in place to really capitalize on this regional food system opportunity. It will not be a formal plan though, that's important. Like what you know of as the farm to plate plan, it will not look like that. This is really the foundational research that will help us to understand what's actually possible to produce in the region. What types of food products, what, what, what are different food categories? And then within each state, within the region as a whole, and, and how uh, will that food get distributed in terms of different market channels? So that's a, a big part of what we're focused on right now is this foundational research. And we're also strengthening our relationships with state ag commissioners across the six states and with funders across the six states um, and all the nonprofit organizations and trade associations that are, that are engaged in this work. So we've built a 14 member research team uh, across the uh, five different research areas across the six states. Uh, and again, this research is to inform then the strategy development and investment and policy recommendations that would support increasing food consumption to 30% by 2030. Uh, and this is a very, uh, as you'll see in a minute, a very uh, interesting and multi-layered research project. I have to say, I've, I have never coordinated something quite as complex as what I'm doing right now. Um, so we have there are three main teams of researchers, and I won't spend any real time on this. You can read it in the slides, but to know that there, there's, th there's three uh, multi-researchers in a team for the dietary needs, uh, called dietary needs team. And I'll explain a little bit more about what they're working on. Then we have a market demand team of a number of researchers. Uh, again, these are people from across the region that have different domain expertise. And then we have a production team also, and they are looking at uh, what we can actually produce within each of the six states. Um, and then we have some additional analysis that's coming, that, that is happening. So looking, just like we have in Vermont every year, we tell you what our, how many jobs and how many businesses exist in the food system. <clears throat> We've just done that for the other five states. So we now understand what the total amount is for the whole region. We're also uh, looking at food flows. I, I think you may recall, I showed you some slides last year of, this, of the United States that had a lot of like spaghetti lines all the, over the place that showed the, the, the way in which food flows just from a distribution perspective across the country. And we just got some updated numbers um, data that will allow us to look at a 10 year time span. And, and what we want to understand in that is how much of, of the food that is being produced in New England is traded within New England amongst ourselves, and then how much is exported and how much additional food is imported into the region. So we have a better sense of what are we really looking at in terms of import substitution, right? Because ultimately to get to 30%, there's two ways to do it. We get to 30% by producing more and keeping more of what we produce in the region. And then of what we already produce, keeping more of that within the region, right? So that we're doing import substitution, meaning we're, we're importing less of what we eat and exporting less of what we eat to the rest of the country, right? We keep it within the region as much as possible. Well, and it, it would be good, Alan, it, when you're doing that uh, is, you know, that, there's all kinds of talk about vehicles pollute in the atmosphere. And if when you get those numbers, if you broke that down into truckloads, because it all gets trucked in here or trucked out of here, uh, how much it's cutting that travel down and, and how much it's uh, helping with, with our overall climate change stuff, that would, It'd be another bonus. Yes. Yeah, we're very interested in that too, because what we don't want to have happen, we know that agricultural, some agricultural practices contribute a lot to greenhouse gas emissions. Right. And so what we don't want is we increase production and then 
cause more damage from a climate change perspective, right? We want to have to be using the best uh, available approaches and practices um, to the production. And that's not just pure agricultural farming production. It's also, for instance, electrifying the, the, the truck fleets so that we're using you know, electric trucks, um, that we are having solar panels on all of these big, huge warehouses, for instance, that from electricity, that are huge electricity sucks because, of, because they have so much refrigeration uh, inside, for instance. So we won't have a lot of detail on that, Senator, but um, I think it, we will be pointing in that direction that there are major opportunities to uh, do this in the right way that will make sure that we're being really climate smart about it. Yeah, uh, being yeah, being a a truck person, um, I know you know from talking with other large companies from out in the west where they uh, ship a lot of that product in here. None of them really like coming because they have to drive back out of here empty. Uh, for you know, four or five hundred miles to get a load going back toward home, so it yep. would it would really make a difference, I think, uh, overall if we eventually get get this under control. Yeah, no, I think that's a I think that's a great point around the the opportunities for backhauling and keeping the circulation really within the region much more efficient on so many levels. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the final piece that, again, I think I'm, I'm really excited about this. Um, Nick Rockler is uh, part of Kvet and Rockler, as in Tom Kvet. Uh, so his business partner, Nick Rockler, is uh, going to be basically conducting an economic impact analysis for all of, each of the six states and then as a region so that we can understand overall what are the direct, indirect, and induced economic benefits of the food system within this six-state region. Um, and I think that gives us then a lot of clout to be able to say, hey, we are really a major sector and we're really also important because of needing to secure the food supply uh, uh, for all the reasons that you know. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that a lot of this foundational research will also just give us more tools and more and a stronger, even stronger narrative to talk about the, the need for investment in this sector because of its impact on many levels. So here's basically what we're doing. And you don't need to understand the nitty gritty of this. This is a very initial stage um, uh, diagram, but I'll just walk you through it so that you understand what we're ultimately trying to get at, which is, so if you start up here in the upper left-hand corner, this is basically these boxes are representation of all the food that is produced and flows um, within the rest of the U.S. and the world. And a portion of that comes to New England and comes to Vermont. And then next to that, you have all of the food that is produced within New England. And we import a bunch and we export a bunch and we consume a bunch, right? So that's all that is basically showing is that there's these three different buckets what we, what, of what we, what we eat. We import, we export, and we consume what we've um, produced and some to some degree. And ultimately what we're what we're saying is we want to we want to shift the percentages here of what we're we want to reduce what we're importing. We want to on some level reduce some of what we're exporting and we want to increase what we're consuming from within the region. So we want to understand then uh, in this middle here of what we need, what do we actually need? how much could we actually be producing of all the different types of food that we, that we consume? And what would be, um, and, and that includes both raw as well as manufactured or processed, right? So this is, we're gonna be using the, the Vermont local food definition that came into being a year ago um, as the definition for how we think about um, what we count as New England food, right? So it's not going to be just Vermont specific, it'll be from New England, but we're going to use the basic structure of the Vermont local food counts for how we think about raw, what is raw food and what is processed food from within the region. So what, what do we actually need? What do we actually eat, right? And looking at that now. 
And then we're gonna be looking then, you move into going farther to the right, there's lots of ways that that food gets produced. This DIY stack of dairy and fruits and vegetables. These are like, that's do it yourself, right? These are people who are hunting, they're fishing, they're gathering, they are having their own vegetable gardens. They have their own animals that they're slaughtering, whatever it is. The next in the green here is direct to consumer. DTC is direct to consumer. So there are people that will get a lot of what they consume from uh, directly from farms through farmers markets, CSAs. And then, then there's also uh, food that is produced through a manufacturing or processing uh, way in which you know all of these different foodstuffs get processed and manufactured. And then eventually, the, of what of some portion of all of that of what gets produced in the region gets distributed. And so you drop down into distribution. And this is just simply to say, and a bunch of that gets distributed. It gets then sold through more, through various uh, channels. So we're going to be trying to understand through the in-plan model, then what is the overall economic impact of all of that activity? And then we're going to be looking at um, it, sort of the, the market demand. Well, like, okay, we produce all this stuff, but what do people actually want? What, what, is, what, are, the, what are the different, um, the level of market demand for this uh, food and and the population projections over the, between now and 2030, well, how many of us do we <clears throat> do we need to actually feed? And so how we're going to try to understand uh, what, we, what we actually need is, is by updating the New England Food Vision, there are, there are two different diets, right? So you think about, if you think about this circle, these two circles here as kind of like a plate. And each one of these wedges is a different type of food that might get produced within the region. So what are we actually consuming the types of food by food category, are we actually eating as a region now, both at, at the individual state level, which we'll have, and then as a region? You know, how many pounds of potatoes? How many pounds of melons? How many pounds of, of, <clears throat> of, of very different, different types of dairy products? How many pounds of meat, of different types of meat? And then we're going to take a look at, well, what's a preferred diet as another option, right? There's you could think about getting to 2030 by saying, okay, we're just gonna go steady with population projections and we're gonna eat exactly today as how, we're gonna eat exactly uh, in 2030 the way that we've, we're eating today, right? So what does that supply curve look like? And then we're saying, okay, well, what if we were more regionally resilient, we were more climate friendly and we ate in a more healthy way based on what, say, USDA MyPlate actually says we should be eating. What would that look like? And how, how, and how much would need to be produced uh, if we were to eat that way by 2030? So we'll have two different diets where we look at what would the production need to be if, if we were then able to say that 30% of everything that we produced in the region was actually staying here and was consumed in the region. Follow me with me. So then, you know, and part of this is we have to look at it from the different influences on people, their age, their income, where they live, their race, ethnicity, what markets are available to them across the region, the kind of preferred market. You know, some people really only want to do farmers markets and CSAs. Others only want to go to grocery stores or only want to go to big box retailers. So we have to account for all of that. And then finally, we get to then how does it actually move from the production, the supply stage, through the distribution channels to the end markets, to the end consumer. And that's where we want to break it down by like, okay, well, how much of what we produce could flow through institutions like hospitals and colleges and schools? How much could flow, how much is going to need to flow through grocery stores? How much is going to flow through restaurants? How many are going to flow through food pantries? We've never calculated how much local food is a potential to flow through, say, our food banks. So ultimately getting at this 30 by 30, um, what would it really, what would it really look like? What, what, what's possible? Not the how we would get there, but just what is possible. Does that make sense? You with me? Well, I would think we need to know all these things to make it all work. That's for, for certain. Right. 
So, um, so as I mentioned, we're going to be doing this, these two different plates of business as usual, and then an aspirational healthier diet. So um, uh, we'll, we'll get to uh, the number of acres that are required to produce this food. And then also, what are we thinking about in terms of the pounds? So like the pounds of potatoes, the pounds of beef in order by food category in order to get to this um, 30% uh, red, uh, level. We are also going to, at the very end, attempt to back into what would it actually cost for a household to eat in this regionally healthier oriented way? Because that's sort of like the holy grail, right? Is to, like, okay, if, if the only people that can eat this way are the wealthy, then it's a, it's a non-starter. Right, so that, because then if we know what it costs to really eat this way, because we know that production costs in the New England are higher than other parts of the country, then that gives you all more tools to figure out, well, how do we actually go about supporting producers so that ultimately the food that they're producing can in fact feed everybody regardless of income. So that, well, you know. And and the slaughter facilities, the processing exactly. facilities, uh, you know, do they want their products fresh? Do they certain percentage frozen? Yeah. Uh, so we need some quick freeze uh, operations. Uh, there's, there's a lot. And then a distribution system. So there's a lot to putting together a whole kind of different feeding uh, program. Exactly, because we might say, well, we think we could actually get to 30% of our meat consumption needs for the region, but guess what? <laughs> we need, you know, I'm just making up a number here. We need 10,000 more acres in grass, in, in, in grass-based uh, foraging, and we need, I'm gonna make up another number, you know, we need, 15 more regional, like regionally at scale processing, meat processing facilities across the six state region, right? Yeah. And so then from your perspective, then, well, how could we support that through policy, through investments, public dollars, those kinds of things? Well, and of course we know that Maine is, is known for, or has been anyways, for their potatoes and, right. and Massachusetts, they do blue, uh, is it cranberries and things yep. like that? Yeah. Uh, yep. uh, so by working with all the states, you can kind of zero in on certain production product, you know, products that we can all produce yep. and not be competing with each other. Yeah, that's exactly, exactly right. Um, because we all have different soils, you know, and things that we can grow. And then we have different sized farms in terms of what we can grow. We have different levels of, of manufacturing capacity and all that stuff. So, um, so the, the production team, this is what they're gonna, they're currently working on right now is, is finalizing their, the, basically how it is they're gonna take all the different data sets and crunch the numbers to get at these uh, food category production numbers that we're looking for. So they're taking ag data and also because we've got a large fisheries off the coast uh, of New England, all the fisheries data. And we're looking at then what is the regional self-reliance production numbers that we, we think are possible. And then, um, and, and so that, and then we're also really looking at the carrying capacity of the land base, right? Because we can't overtax our soils and overtax. Um, and, we, and we also just, you know, there's only a finite amount of land available. So we have to understand like, what do we have to work with? So we've done that piece of, of the analysis. Um, we've got some preliminary, um, uh, production, just having a general sense of collecting all the current data. And we've built a, sp uh, a spreadsheet that everything is going into. Um, 
I'm going to skip this next piece. So the next piece that they're doing is actually starting to use the data and putting it into this model to sort of get some preliminary milestones. Um, and then, whoops, and then uh, we're going to do some stakeholder uh, input sessions. We're, we're going to be in February, March, uh, having meetings with producers, food, different types of food producers across the six New England states so that we could say, okay, this is what we think we can do. This is what the model's telling us, this is what the data is telling us. Like now tell us, does that seem realistic or not? Is that, it, it, does that feel in your gut like what you're seeing as possible in terms of the marketplace? So we wanna validate <clears throat> in essence what the data is telling us. Uh, and then we'll revise all of that and get to the point, hopefully by April, May-ish, where we have a, a, a strong sense of what is the production possibility part of the equation. And to your point, Senator Starr, about um, this is now, this is Northeast data and this is old data. This is 2001 to 2009, but this is gets to your point of, of Maine is really good at potatoes. We are really good at dairy. What this shows you, this, ta this table shows you is that we are currently, if this was between 2001 and 2009, we were producing as a region, as the Northeast, actually, this is not just New England, this is the whole Northeast, 13 billion pounds or whatever it is um, uh, of, of dairy, for instance, we were consuming 17 billion pounds. I think this, it's, it's, I'm not sure what the exact metrics are here, but uh, the point is that you can see just in the order of magnitude, we're only producing 76% of what we were actually consuming from within the region for dairy. But you look down through this, you know, eggs were doing pretty good, shellfish, yeah, below 50%, turkeys, chicken, fish, lamb, beef, pork, way below what we're actually uh, uh, able to produce here is what we're, we're consuming. So we're consuming way more of these key products, for instance, and that they're not coming from the region because we're not producing it. So we're gonna, part of this research is to update this and to try to get a sense of, again, what is the production capacity? And so that we can increase these, these numbers uh, on, on the right-hand side here of the um, regional uh, reliance, uh, how much we can actually consume what we're, what we're producing. Yeah, and those, those numbers are really telling, aren't they? Yeah, and this is really old data. I'm really curious what what the current data actually shows, right? And well, this is this this is not even put, like vegetables. We could put quite a few hog farms right in uh, Chittenden County, I bet. <laughs> so no so, comment. That's good. <laughs> so I'm all for is, it. I'm all for it, Mr. Chair. <laughs> this is just, again, just to show you like the kind of things that we're looking at, right? This was some research that was done for the Northeast <clears throat> grouped around this regional self-reliance notion by these are uh, vegetables and uh, things like sweeteners, like honey and, um, and grains and such. So again, to show you what are we actually producing that we could be consuming uh, in the region. Some stuff, you know, like, uh, you know, melons are challenging in the Northern parts because it needs a longer growing season, for instance, but, uh, and wheat is challenging for lots of reasons we know, but we're still like onions are in the 20 to 50% range and potatoes, fresh potatoes are still in the 20 to 50% range. So there's a lot of things in these different columns that we want to shift so that we're, we're consuming more of them and we're producing more of them. And so ultimately where we're getting to, <clears throat> this is just a, <clears throat> a, a visual of, of a, the model that we're building which will allow us to actually do scenario planning to say, okay, if we want to get to uh, where dairy is 80%, uh, meeting 80% of our consumption needs and vegetables are getting our, you know, we're producing 60% of our vegetable needs and, and such, 
Um, what does that actually then look like in terms of acres, pounds, those kinds of things? So, so we can actually then eventually be able to play around with this to, to think about the trade-offs, right? Because <clears throat> let's just say, uh, well, we know New Englanders eat more chicken than turkeys, but we are not producing a lot of uh, turkeys as much as we could. Are, could could more turkey production offset some of chicken consumption because we can do more turkeys, you know, because we might have some limits on chicken. So like it's it's being able to play around with those different kinds of scenarios to see what would it take in terms of acres um, to produce it and how many pounds per year would we need to. So this is the kind of like highest level spreadsheet that we're gonna, that I think will be most useful to you is to be able to see this table filled in and give you a sense of what's possible. So that's what's coming. Right, um, and another thing, Alan, that, that it would be good to chat about with the professional people, um, like with families being smaller today than they were 20 years ago, Maybe we only need 14, 15 pound turkeys instead of 25 and 30 pound turkeys that you know, most, most of us can't use up in a week if we cook one. Um, yeah, things like, things like that are, are worth knowing about uh, down the road as we move forward. Chris, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I'm curious. Uh, uh, this is very, very interesting. And, and I feel like things we've been talking around for many years since I've been on Senate Ag. So it's great to see. Um, I, I, I kind of remember talking about it in just broad strokes and, and the look on your face of you have no idea how complicated it is. Well, now I have a better idea of how complicated it is. So thank you. And and uh, exciting to, to, to hear that there's a regional group of smart folks trying to get their arms around it. Uh, I'm curious if you factored in or if it, there's so many variables, but there's a federal angle here. Um, when we think about costs and, and the chair mentioned trucking, uh, is anybody wondering, I mean, the, there will come a time when we will no longer tolerate tomatoes coming from California, at least without some price point impact, because shipping costs are kind of ignored in, in prices. I, I mean, crudely right. speaking. But and, people, and, are, people are really looking at that. Yeah, you know, it's gotten up to $2 and a half a mile. Yeah. The cost of moving a product and, you know, that's expensive. So when we think about this 10 years in the future, does is there any way of, because because I would guess that means the affordability of the local food is much different than, than it is right now. And I, I'm just curious if that, if there's a way to build that in or if anybody's been thinking about that kind of aspect. Yeah, it's a great question. And, and in many ways it's, it's kind of the holy grail question when it comes to federal subsidy policy, right? And all the money that our taxpayer dollars that go to, to subsidize uh, the so-called cheap food uh, in the, this country that is, it's cheap because it's been heavily subsidized by too large agribusiness, right? And so ultimately where I think this ends up playing out from a policy perspective is putting pressure on the federal government to, to reconsider its national subsidy policy to more of a regionalized food subsidy policy. And what that would then do is increase, for instance, you know, we get a paltry amount in Vermont for specialty crop block grants, which is basically all the types of, specialty crops are you know, all the different types of vegetables and grains and fruits and stuff, right? We get a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. It's ridiculous. How many millions and billions are going to subsidize wheat and corn and soy that go into you know, a myriad of, of pro processed products that we shouldn't be eating from a health perspective, right? So we're, 
we're subsidizing with our tax dollars unhealthy food that we're then consuming and then paying for it through our healthcare system, right? I mean, it's just, it's insanity. So what I really see as the opportunity here is to is if we can calculate what would it take for the six New England states, and then you could think about adding in New York and Pennsylvania, New Jersey, sort of take it from a more regional Northeast perspective. And we think about, well, how do we actually make the this food affordable and make trucking from farther away, even more unaffordable. Um, that and then the southeast does that, and the north and the southwest does it, and the northwest does it. And that's not to say we're creating little islands within the United States because we'll never be able to produce 100% of what we eat. Trade will always be there, but if each region of the country can be somewhat more regionally self-reliant, there's greenhouse gas benefits. There's security in terms of supply chains, diversification of supply chains. Um, all of that become more possible. So then how does federal policy support that? I think is ultimately where we need to head, right? And, and I think um, the, the, the key here is, I think that right now anyways, we'll see what happens in 2022 and 2024, but the Biden administration has been signaling this. The recent uh, announcement that came out, for instance, about wanting to increase competition in meat processing nationally and putting more grant dollars <laughs> into regional meat processing facilities because of the monopoly level uh, production. Uh, I, I think is a is a is a signal that there's an opening because of the pandemic to really explore more of a regionalized food system, because while on one hand our national food system you could argue has become so efficient, so hyper efficient, but it's also really brittle. Any disruption is is has a cascading effect and makes us very vulnerable when some part of the system doesn't work, whether it's the, the issues going on in the ports of Los Angeles with all these big cargo ships just sitting out there waiting to unload from food from who or from you know products from who knows where, to having you know four companies controlling 60 to 70 percent of our meat supply. Well, you know, a couple of them is you know are owned by a Chinese and 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 Brazilian owned companies. So there's a lot that is messed up that we need to fix and it's not going to be something we can do overnight. It's, you know, this is a generational effort that is required. But how long we've been at it, what, five, six, 10 years. Been yeah. quite a bell. Y yes. And we've made a lot of progress. And I think that people are starting to wake up. I mean, the pandemic has really helped to wake people up about what is at risk. And you know, when the fires in California and the droughts that are anticipated more and more in the Midwest and California and in Mexico, it makes us more vulnerable here in the Northeast. And I think people are waking up to that. So how, how can we take advantage of this opportunity and invest in the infrastructure and the distribution networks that we need to, to, to take care of more of our own food needs within the region? That's ultimately what we have to get to. Yeah. Um, so just very briefly, the, these are the this is the types of market demand questions that we're going to be answering through this re this research, um, and really trying to understand how do we then align our production our, our 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 desired production increases with all of the different ways that consumers ultimately acquire food, whether that's you know at a food pantry or at a grocery store or at a restaurant. Uh, and really trying to understand these different market channels and where could we be increasing the amount of local or regional food through these channels? You know, what would be retailers, the grocery retailers slice of the, of the pie, for instance, in terms of increasing their sourcing of regionally produced food? So that's where we're, we're headed on the market demand side. And you know, this is just another another way to think about it. Is you've got all these different direct to consumer channels, but then the big kahuna is how do we get into the grocery stores? We know that uh, close to seventy percent of all the food that anyone uh, eats is coming through the grocery channel, and the that's big, been the big ones too. I mean, exactly. the little mom and pops are the other ones that'll buy local stuff. 
Right, exactly. So we got to figure out how to get in there. And that then, of course, whenever you're dealing with a system and a whole supply chain, you've got to be able to think about the distributors and how it's how it's moving to then um, get to these different uh, types of market outlets to then reach the, the end consumer. So that's what we're that's where we're headed. Um, and just as a just in case you're interested, this is this is for the whole country. We're trying to get regional data, but I thought this was actually quite interesting. So FAH is um, food at home. So fifth, so we know that in Vermont that these numbers are very different, right? Because I mean, other than maybe Chittenden County, uh, a lot of people just they make all their their food and, and eat most of what they eat at home. So this is food purchased from different market channels for at-home consumption across the country, 50% of all food is prepared at home. And they're getting it from grocery stores, from warehouse clubs, from mail order, those kinds of things. 43% is food away from home. So restaurants, hospitals, schools, right? Limited uh, uh, various, um, donated food outlets, hotels, right? This is where the food, this is, these are the, like the channels that it moves through in order to, for either you're consuming it at home or you're consuming it away from home. But, but this, is the, this is the whole US. Yeah, those numbers are kind of interesting. Right? I mean, it's almost 50-50. Yeah. Which you think back 10, 15, 20 years, uh, you know, that was not the case. I didn't realize Chris and like Brian out of Rutland eat out all the time. I figured they ate at home like us honkies up north. <laughs> well, the legislature would, would uh, contribute to that in a normal year. Yeah, so, that's true. That's that would right. add up to a lot of money. Yep. Yeah. And I, I would think a lot of lunch goers, you know, in the, in a more normal environment are grabbing something. Grab a sandwich and run. Yeah. 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 So as part of our market demand work, we're trying to also, uh, again, in each of these different types of, of uh, locations where food is acquired is really understand some of the unique attributes you know, one of the things that we have under, become more, um, we understand at greater detail the challenges that small producers in particular have in getting onto the store shelves in grocery stores. There are all sorts of barriers to that. And so ultimately, if grocery stores is the largest market channel, we have also got to figure out how to penetrate uh, those markets with regional and local product uh, at a at a systems level, and that impacts, and a lot of that is also connected to distribution systems. So, so this is just simply to say, there's a lot of complexity in each one of these market channels that we're going to be trying to suss out, and to, as a way of understanding, then what is the contribution that colleges can make towards the 30 by 30 goal? What's the contribution that grocery stores can make to the 30 by 30 goal? Um, and then what we don't yet have funding for that is sort of on our wish list is we want to get the other five New England states to do the local food counts that we do here in Vermont. So we're talking with the commissioners, um, in the other five states to see if they can pony up a little bit of money and we can get the baseline of the percentage of local food, local food in Maine. What's the percentage of local food in Massachusetts? So that we would have that as baseline that we could then do those same counts in 2025 and 2030 so we can see whether we're making any progress. just like we've done here in Vermont. So we'd like to have that done across the six states. So we're talking with them about coughing up the money on that. Um, and then we would really like to be able to do some kind of uh, infrastructure inventory uh, by uh, market channel type um, and, and particularly around key processing like cold storage, meat processing, distribution infrastructure, warehouses, 
to just get a sense of like, how much do we have in the region and where is it located? <laughs> so we can see then, okay, if we're gonna increase production, then we're gonna need X number more meat processing plants and Y number more warehouses and central terminals where food comes in and out of, for instance. And then ultimately we need to understand what's it all gonna cost. And then we'll be, the idea is to produce the report of all of this uh, for sometime in September. So it'll be ready for you all to review next fall as you think about uh, heading into next year's session. Um, and I think that'll, there'll be a synopsis and then there'll be all the details. So if you wanna get into the weeds, you, you can go down, way down the rabbit hole. Well, so, that's well, where we're at. Well, it sounds like your work is going quite well. Are you, are you, uh, is like the agency of ag helping with this to get these other states involved a little bit? Um, we, we will be, uh, we have been talking with um, Abby and the Anson about hosting a meeting of the other five ag commissioners to get this up an update, just like I've given to you so that they, you know, many of them, they all know that something's in the works, but you guys actually know more than, than they do at this point, because we haven't met with them yet. And uh, so the intention is to be bringing them along and then, <clears throat> you know, talk with Anson and Amanda Beal, who's the commissioner over Maine is fantastic as well. She's very connected to this work. Um, think about like, what could their role be then in, on the implementation end of things? So once this comes out, what does this mean for their departments of agriculture? What do they do with this? How do they think about their available grant making dollars or drawing down federal resources or or what, that, that's really the next piece was once we have this foundational research and we say, okay, Rhode Island, this is what we need you to do. New Hampshire, this is what we need you to do. Like, okay, so now how are you gonna do that? How do we marshal the resources, the people, the infrastructure to make that happen? Uh, questions from the committee? No, good. Um, anything, Alan? That uh, we should know about or be working on to help your cause out or things sounds like things are going well but I want to ask yeah no I mean I think I think things are going well um, you know I'm, I would be very happy when the actual research piece is done <laughs> it is really complicated um, it, there's days when my brain really hurts <laughs> But, um, but once we get this done, then I think, you know, then it's really going to be these conversations about how do we make more strategic investments. So I would say on this front, it's sort of just keep moving forward on making the best use of ARPA dollars for infrastructure, because that can't hurt. Like, there's no reason to wait for this research to come out, right? We know we're gonna need more infrastructure. We know we need more distribution systems, strengthening our, our local and regional distribution. We know we need more warehouse and cold storage space. So let's just can, like put whatever ARPA dollars towards that that we can. Um, you know, there's this new company over in, in um, that the Abbey Group is, is launching to actually do more milk processing to specifically supply schools with Vermont milk. You know, projects like that, let's get behind those because we know we're gonna need them and they're gonna benefit um, what we're trying to do as a region. What, what are they doing uh, at the Abbey? They're 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 launching a another a, another company specifically to develop uh, and put in place the equipment to be able to supply schools with the milk from Vermont. I'll be done. Yeah, yeah, that's good. They put in a I, I re, we had a pre application from them from Working Lands, um, so we're uh, I was I was particularly excited to hear about that one. They're doing some other exciting stuff, Bobby. It might be worth bringing them in, but they're also looking to build a packing facility to do more of these lunches with local food at schools and stuff when we give them away. So they're they're doing a lot to try to grow this up here. They see the yeah, shifting yeah. market and they're trying to invest there now. 
Yeah. And where where is that happening, Corey? In Sheldon, Enosburg right. area, Sheldon, right. Enosburg area. Yep. Yeah. Maybe we can come up with forty three grand to to help them out. <laughs> yeah, boy, that's going to be a lift. Um, so, uh, anything else, uh, committee members? Ellen, anything else? Well, so we are, we, um, we're, I'm hoping that I think February 17th, we're going to come in and talk about Farm to Plate. Yeah. Um, and we'll have a 10 year retrospective for you that takes a look at everything that's been accomplished over the last 10 years. Um, in some ways, we should have done the retrospective and then the new 10 year plan, but we did it the other way. So, um, <laughs> but you'll, you'll, I think you'll get to see the fruits of, of, of all of our labor and all of the funding support that you've provided and, and moral support over the years and policy changes you've made um, and how far we've come in 10 years. Uh, and we'll give you a brief update on where things are at with Farm to Plate going forward into the new 10 years. And, um, and then at some point, uh, to the extent to which you uh, would be of interest, we are moving forward on the development of a food security plan for the state. This was one of the priority strategies in the new, in the new plan. And it's specifically about, and it really complements this New England work because it's really about how does Vermont improve non-emergency time with more local food getting to Vermonters and then during emergency times, how are we making sure that we're sourcing as much local food as possible? So what would right. that actually look like? So building on what we've learned over the last two years of the pandemic with Vermont Everyone Eats, you know, for instance, and other emergency management planning, this is the perfect time. What are the lessons we learned about what worked well and what didn't work as well as it could have? with sourcing in local to the distribution of, of food during emergencies. Well, I think that, that meeting, we're gonna have a joint meeting, I think with the house members on the 17th. Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. So well, all that to come. Yeah. If there isn't any other questions, thank you very much, Alan. It's always a, a pleasure to have you in. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, and we'll, we'll stay in touch. Um, and committee, uh, <coughs> I guess we're pretty well done for the morning. Uh, we'll see you. Anything uh, anybody wants to bring up uh, before we adjourn for the morning? If not, um, thanks.